In Ohio, we've always had a thriving farming community, and today the Buckeye State is actually one of the nation's leaders in agriculture. Charlene, if you were to guess, what do you think the top three things that farmers in Ohio produce nationally are? I would say corn, mm -hmm. soybeans, okay. eggs. Yeah, well, <laughs> as of this original broadcast, Ohio ranks number one in Swiss cheese. What? Didn't see that coming. Uh, number two for eggs. Yes. You got it. And number three for tomatoes and pumpkins. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, you know, we hear a lot about farming and about how to prepare our food, but sometimes we forget there are whole processes to get those crops from the farm to our tables. So that's what we're talking about today. Our first story is about a grain elevator that was an important part of Canal Winchester's agricultural history. Architectural historian Jeff Darby heads over to the historic O.P. Cheney Grain Elevator to learn about its importance to the community and its plan for restoration. Canal Winchester was just Winchester until the canal came through, the Ohio and Erie Canal in the 1830s. It's been known as Canal Winchester since, which suggests something of the transportation history of this community. The Canal Winchester Area Historical Society has done a lot to help preserve part of that story, transportation, but also local industry as well, uh, and local education. So we're going to have a visit today, and I think you'll find some really interesting uh, architecture and interesting industrial and transportation history. Well, hello. Hi, Jeff. How are you? Good to Great. see you. Welcome to the Canal Winchester Historical Society. Well, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. So I understand we're going to see a very interesting building today. We are, in fact. It was a grain elevator. It was built by Judge John Cheney and his son, O.P. Cheney, in the 1870s. In 1850, Judge John Cheney and his son, O.P., founded the Empire Mill. That was actually a mile away from here at about the 40 lock of the uh, canal uh, out by Groveport and Gender Road. That burned. And then in the late 1870s, O.P. Cheney built this elevator. Well, that makes sense because by then the railroad had come through town and really it had pretty much supplanted the canal. It absolutely did. And it ran right here, as you can see the track here. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd love to see the inside of the mill. Is that something that's possible? Well, I'm not dressed for that, <laughs> at least not to go to the top, but I'll send you up and then I'll meet you inside. That sounds great. Awesome. I'll, I'll head right away. Thanks. bit of a climb. I guess that's why they call it an elevator, but I don't think it has one. Oh, one more flight. Well, I'm almost there. Boy, just getting to work here is a challenge. <laughs> Ralph. Hi, Jeff. Welcome to the head house. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. It is the head house. There's yeah. the roof. Yes, it they is. can't go any further. Yeah. So what happens up here? As the grain would come up from the basement, it would come up on the bins and would dump it into kind of a holding area here. And then the uh, worker would take this pipe and remove it from bin to bin. There are about four bins that were below us. And oh, I see. Move the grain into each one of the bins, depending upon what it is. So the pipe was flexible. You could move yes. it to, I see right. there, there are holes in the floor that are covered now for safety, but that's where, the, where we go down into the various other bins for the different kinds exactly. of grain. Exactly. And all of this uh, grain, as it was coming up, or, or it was being filtered from place to place, is all done by gravity. Mm -hmm. So there was no other mechanical movement other than moving it from one bin to the other. And they would haul roughly about 3,000 pounds of grain a day up here. Okay, so that's a ton and a half. Yes, it is. Yeah, so it's quite a bit. Well, speaking of mechanical, there are wonderful gears and chains and things. Yes. Um, these are all related to what, moving the buckets that bring moving. the grain up. Exactly. That's primarily what they serve right. as, because right. you can see these giant bearings and right. big gears and chains and things. Yeah. 
Initially it was done by steam, and then later on when electricity came in, they changed to electricity. Well, it's so fortunate that so much of this is intact, yes. including the names of the companies that supplied some yes. of the machinery. I think yes. that's just wonderful. Yeah, Sydney, Ohio, I guess, is the, one of the manufacturers mm -hmm. uh, of, of some of the gears and equipment that's up here. Well, I'd be happy to see the, uh, the, the next level down, see sure. what happens there if you want to lead the sure. way. Why don't we walk on down this way? All right. So we're at the next level down. What happens down at this level? And the grains came in. Now, it could be corn, it could be wheat, it could be rye. We're dropped down into this auger that's right here. And then from the auger, it would then be distributed into uh, each one of these legs, which would then take it down into a bin below us. All of this is done by gravity, so as it's moving through, it would just drop into the bin that happened to be open. Once it went into the bin, it would then go out to either a rail car or a uh, a uh, canal at one time when they had the canals coming through, or even, I guess, wagons that would then carry the grain to wherever they wanted it you know, to go. This is sort of the intermediate process before final delivery. Exactly, yeah. So this is kind of like the storage place. And just to be clear, this mill didn't grind grain into flour of any kind. This was simply bringing in grain, sorting it, selling it to people who were going to use it at a, at a flouring mill, something yes. like that. Yes, sorting and storing it until someone purchased it for milling or whatever they wanted to do with it. This would serve a fairly large area, I assume, in terms of a farming area? Yes, I think, at, uh, I think well, once the railroads came through, it would go as far as New York. So, I mean, yeah. it would take it, you know, quite a distance out of, the, out of the area. So the economy then for the farmers expanded quite a bit, you know, not just in and around the area or even in, you know, central Ohio was pretty much states surrounding us. That was a process, and I think Bruin is waiting for you downstairs. Well, thanks so much. I've learned a lot, and I really appreciate it. Glad to have you, Jeff. Bye. Bye now. Well, hello again, Bruna. I'm glad you're back. How was upstairs? Hey, it's quite a tour. It's, it's a wonderful place with those stairs. Oh, my. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you're back and you're lucky to be up there because not everybody's allowed to go up there. Well, I can see why it might be a little bit hazardous. So we're here at grade level, uh, and what happened in this room? This was probably the busiest room in the grain elevator. The farmer would bring his wagon out right outside of this mm -hmm. space. He would leave the load of his grain and it would be weighed and then it would be distributed upstairs where you were to the different bins, then either go by rail or be individually bagged for sale. I could see there are other spaces in this level. There are many, many more spaces. Things like this wagon right now are just being stored here. Uh -huh. This would not have been in here yeah, originally. In a working space like this. And I noticed these wonderful big uh, wood columns and some of them are, are uh, trimmed on the edge, a chamfer, they call it, to give it a little elegant kind of look. You know, there's real craftsmanship here. Uh, the way this is put together, it's not a fancy house. It's, you know, it's a mill, an elevator, but it, it's really beautifully done. And, oh, wait, there's a hole in the floor here. What's this? This hole in the floor actually housed a giant auger-type piece of equipment. Think of an enormous corkscrew that ran the whole length of the building and would push the grain all the way through the building back into the next area for storage. Is that still there? That building unfortunately burned down in 1978 and one of our trustees to the Historical Society today was actually the newly appointed fire chief for Madison Township but fortunately, his team did a fantastic job, and there was a cinder block wall that prevented the fire from oh, passing from that, that building. Well, I'm so glad the fire got stopped and this building was saved. It's, it's really important, you know, Ohio is an agricultural state still, and knowing some of the history of that is, is really important. But I know there's a future here too, so what do you have We're planned? We're excited about the future here. Come with me, I'll show you. Okay. This is the best way to show you what we're going to do. This is an image of what we're hoping to achieve here in the next four or five years, adding a new entrance into the facility and a center here 
that might house uh, brides on the day of a wedding. It will have public restrooms that will be accessible for all outdoor events, even while the rest of the facility is uh, closed up. A patio on the back side of it as well, up against the railroad tracks. This is the interior. This is the comfort center we just talked about. Perhaps in a wedding, this might be a chapel for this ceremony. This might be where the reception is held. Or it might be good for a music concert or lecture, any kind of educational purpose as well. Well, that's a great plan. You're, you're preserving the historic building, but giving it a new life with these different facilities. It just makes so much sense. Well, it's a passion of the Historical Society to first of all preserve the building, but secondly give it back to the community because it belongs to them so they can enjoy it. That really is true. Well, thank you very much for thank a great tour. Thank you so much. I hope you come back when it's finished. Looking forward to it. I can't wait to see what that grain elevator looks like when it's restored. I'm guessing it's going to be a beautiful event space. I bet you're right, Charlene. And as a follow-up to that history, it's rumored that actor Lon Chaney, best known for his role in horror films in the 1920s, is related to the O.P. Chaney family. you got to be kidding. I, I kid about a lot of things. Lon Chaney's family history is not <laughs> one of them. <laughs> so stay tuned, because <laughs> later we check in with Aaron O'Donovan over at the Columbus Metropolitan Library to see if he can make that connection. Cannot wait to find out about that one. But getting back to our Ohio farm to table theme, next we head over to a special little farm in southern Lorain County where the family who started it has a unique backstory. Chris and I met when I was a senior in college. We're blessed with four kids. Our plan was I was going to teach and he was going to work at Ford and we're going to raise our kids out in the country and rural vibe, rural setting, you know, maybe an animal here or there, 4-H projects. <laughs> Zach is our oldest and then Lucas uh, came around uh, three years later. Early in his life, we noticed that he didn't sleep well. He had some health issues, chronic ear infections. He was then diagnosed with eosinophilic disorder at age seven and a half. And that is where our whole journey took a little detour. Eosinophilic disorder, it can attack anywhere in your GI system. So for Lucas, it was his esophagus. So pretty much his esophagus became a battleground between his white blood cells and food protein. For some people, it might be the protein that's in dairy or wheat or corn or soy. His diagnosis came very early into the research and understanding of the disease. So he was kind of on the forefront and trial end of the control of the disease. So for him, it became an eight food elimination diet. So we removed wheat, corn, soy, dairy, you know, the whole protocol and then use medications and hopefully to keep the inflammation at bay. Unfortunately for him, that didn't work. The only option was to remove all food from his diet and then start on a uh, medical-based formula. And at that time, the only food that didn't have a protein binder that would um, activate this disease was sugar. So he had unlimited sugar in his diet as well. So as a 12-year-old, he was, you know, started off um, loving it because he could have as many dum-dum suckers, pixie sticks, cotton candy as he wanted, and then reintroduce foods into his diet in a very scripted pattern. We really started looking at labels. I mean, it would take, you know, two, three hours to grocery shop because he had to read every label. We no longer did pre-packaged anything because we couldn't guarantee there wouldn't be something in there that may trigger him. You know, really a big part of our lives then became, became food-based. Our first venture into farming started with a blueberry patch. And so we planted 200 blueberry bushes. 
starting our next spring, we were you know, anticipating this great abundance of, of blueberries and, and um, of blueberry jams and muffins and everything that would you know, entail with that. But the blueberry bushes uh, obtained blight and wiped out the entire, we don't have one bush left. So that was our first go around, which didn't go so well. We really looked into developing heirloom vegetables and that lasted a year because between um, babies and kids and washing beets at midnight and um, cutting flowers at 4 a.m. to take them to the market the next day, we learned to have great respect for those who do that kind of farming because it is a labor of love and very intense and very um, knowledge-based, which we did not have that knowledge whatsoever. Where we live, this is before Amazon, before Trader Joe's, before online anything. The closest market that we could really find clean meat, what we would call clean meat, was about an hour and 20 minutes away. So that's when we you know, had the discussion of, do you think that's something that you know, we could do? We saved up every penny and bought four pigs with the thought that worst case, we don't sell any. We can always, you know, friends, family, for ourselves. And then pigs led to chickens, led to beef, led to lambs. Conventional farming has a place in society and, you know, kudos to anybody in agriculture. The work that they do is surely a passion. With that, you know, conventional farming is, is a very traditional you know, row crop farming, or you have hundreds of head of beef. We're considered more of niche farming. We're very, very small in what we do. So, you know, all of our animals are out on pasture. No growth hormones, no antibiotics. Um, we committed to a non-GMO feed for the entire farm. So um, those are things that are important to us, ecologically, sustainability, environmentally. Also is what we needed to do to feed our son. Being a young farmer, maybe not in age-wise, because we were not that young, but um, new to the whole industry of agriculture. The market has been really helpful because I think there's many people that are similar to us, whether there's bakers or brewers or meat producers, vegetable producers, um, they kind of all have a similar story. Maybe their child wasn't sick and they needed to find a food source for their family, but so many of our fellow marketers have a story of their own to tell. It's through that community that we really kind of wrap around each other. So Lucas, last count, had 43 different medical procedures at the end of all of that. He had 13 safe foods. He decided his freshman year in college that he just needed a break from it all. And he really worked on like cleaning his diet and is really conscious of label reading and has committed to a very active lifestyle. So he's an avid rock climber, avid cyclist, avid outdoor enthusiast. You know, we joke that we spent, you know, 13 years getting him well enough to hang off a three quarter of an inch rope, but um, he's happy and thriving and living his best life. My journey personally has been learning to embrace the journey. It may not be the one that you imagined or designed or even hoped for, but there is good and greatness that can be found in each step of the way. I think telling the story is it's a bit healing. It brought us together, fighting the battle together as a family and building the business together as a family. And I think that part of my journey is I have loved meeting all the different people you know, our story is so similar to so many others. Those that are seeking food that can heal their body and help their body. There are so many unique little farms in Ohio, Javier. It really makes that farm to table experience something special. Right, it sure does. Now, all right, Charlene, I think we're ready to find out if actor Lon Chaney is related to the O.P. Chaney family in the first story. You ready? I absolutely am. I thought you'd never ask. So let's find out. So we were asked the question, whether Lon Chaney, the movie actor, had anything to do with the O.P. Chaney mill in Canal Winchester to figure out if there was a relation between the family. 
So the story of Lon Chaney is that, number one, Lon Chaney's not his real name. <laughs> it's actually, the f- f- first thing I found out was his real name was Leonidas Chaney. And I was able to find him in the Los Angeles census in 1920. And then I found that his father's name was Frank H. Chaney, which was important because I had the middle initial. And so I was able to trace Frank and, and Lon together in Los Angeles. Frank I was able to track him back to Colorado Springs. This is 1900. And I was able to find Frank with a wife named Emma and a son named Leonard. Frank is born in Ohio. He's a barber. What I found out about Frank, he was deaf. He actually was at a deaf school in Missouri, and he, that's where he met his wife, Emma Kennedy, at. So I traced Frank back to Ohio, living with his father, James Cheney, in Canal Winchester. So I was able to find him in um, Bloom Township, actually living with his father and his grandfather. You have John, you have James, and you have Frank. You have three generations together, which made it very easy once I got there. I guess I was like, well, three generations together. I see them all on paper together. When I was asked about the mill, I needed to figure out, number one, who first O.P. Cheney was. And I found out it was Oliver P. Cheney, and then I had to figure out who his father was, which was John Cheney. James and um, O.P. are actually half-brothers. Um, so James Cheney was born uh, from the first marriage, and O.P., or Oliver, was um, born from the second marriage that John Cheney had. What was really interesting about John Cheney is I didn't know how important he was. I, I just thought he was a farmer who helped with the mill, but then I started looking into John Cheney a little bit more, and I found out that he was a state senator, a state rep, and also a U.S. House of Representative. Ultimately, Lon had a child named Creighton. He took the stage name Lon Chaney Jr. because they were both really well-known monster actors. Also, Lon Chaney Jr. and Lon Chaney Sr. both died relatively young. They had some health problems. They didn't live nearly as long as John Chaney, who'd lived in well into his 80s. So in the end, yes, the rumor's true. Um, at first, I had my doubts, but ultimately, I did find that Ohio connection and proved that it actually was, in fact, uh, a relation. WOSU's Curious Seabus answers your questions about our region, its history, and its people. Today, Ohioans wear the nickname Buckeye with pride. But how did this strange nut become so beloved in the first place? Well, it turns out that the origin story we've been told again and again for generations might just be a tall tale. We asked historian Raymond Irwin to tell us more. The n- nickname as applied to human beings comes from an historian, Samuel Prescott Hildreth, who wrote a book in 1852, in which he claimed that the nickname comes from a early settler named Ebenezer Sprout, who was a colonel in the militia and led the procession at the first court in Washington County in September 1788. From there, the story goes that some friendly indigenous peoples were there and shouted the name Hetok at him which the white settlers translated at the time as Big Eye of the Buck, because Sprout was six foot four and well built. And the idea is that that nickname then became applied to other settlers in Marietta and then applied to people from Ohio from there on. The real story though, is that um, Hildreth made up the story. And we know this because Hetuck has no relationship to Buckeye. And as a matter of fact, uh, after some digging in the native languages, I discovered that it probably comes from the Lenape word or Delaware word for hicktock, which just means tree. And so at a, at a dinner in 1792, uh, the captain of the Delaware peoples, the Lenape peoples, uh, was commenting on Sprout's size. And he said, that guy basically is as big as a tree. And that's probably where it came from. And so, the name Buckeye then became applied to humans, we think, in the 18-teens and 1820s, and it meant essentially a person from the West or someone from the frontier. It wasn't initially applied to people from Ohio at all until we think the late 1820s, early 1830s. And by 1833, Daniel Drake, who was a physician from Cincinnati, uses the term Buckeye to apply to people born in Ohio. In the 1830s, there are several things that imbue uh, certain positive characteristics. For example, one of the gubernatorial candidates, Wilson Shannon, was the first candidate born in Ohio, 1802. He used Buckeye as a campaign nickname. Around the same time, there was the war between Michigan and Ohio over the strip of land that included 
uh, Toledo. Michigan claimed it, Ohio objected, Governor Lucas sent militia, Michigan sent its own militia, and there was a war, and Governor Lucas used the word Buckeye to be kind of like a battle cry, that the Buckeyes will not be intimidated. And then in 1836, William Henry Harrison uses the Buckeye theme for his own presidential candidacy, which is successful four years later. And in fact, in 1840, the Log Cabin campaign, the Log Cabin is made of Buckeye wood. So you go from uh, an insult in the 18-teens to something of immense pride in the 1830s, a very quick turnaround for the Buckeye. Do you have a question for Curious Seabus? Head over to wosu.org slash curious to submit your idea, vote on which question we should investigate next, and see what we've covered so far. Thanks for being with us. And remember, you can catch all of our episodes on columbusneighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app. And you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and X, formerly Twitter. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. There's a place where the water meets stone. Well, then you'll cross a bridge and you'll know your home. You and I keep going back to the same old places. Across these expanses, well, why do we stay here? Our hearts and habits are on our map of the world. Well, we know where we come from. Where do we go? I've got a place where you